Hello and welcome to this overview of chapter six and statistical inference is the topic for chapter six. In statistical inference, what we're looking for is potential insights to derive to a potential outcome, whether that's a hypothesis or an assumption that we're trying to test to prove or disprove that hypothesis, looking for things that are inside the data that we couldn't find before or statistical confidence that something's going to occur as well. In many applications, we are interested in characteristics of a population. So you're looking at sampling distributions, sets of an overall population of data and finding groups within that that can derive to insights to drive the business. The population mean and the population proportion describe a numerical value and a categorical value variable respectively. It is difficult, if not impossible, to analyze the entire population, meaning if you have an entire data set of many, many records to look through, we can at times analyze the entire pie. We have to look at pieces of it to derive to insight on trends and analysis to find out where the business opportunity is. We make inferences about the characteristics of the population based on a random sample. So we're always looking at a piece of the population or a sample size of that. There's only one population, but many possible samples of a given size. When taking a look at sampling distributions, the thing to keep in mind is you're trying to find the number of potential distributions of a sample. A population parameter is a constant. It's a variable that may be unknown. For example, the population means this U symbol is a parameter. A statistic is a variable whose value depends on the sample. For example, the sample mean is the X over that is a statistic. The value of X is will change if you choose a different random sample. So what it means is, if you've taken a different data set or group, for example, let's look at, say we're looking at marketing analytics and looking at different customer groups. Well, customer group A versus customer group B and C and so on may have different variables within them and different values of those variables. So as we change those random distributions or groups in the analysis, so does our statistic or overall insight. An estimator is a statistic used to estimate a parameter. An estimate is a particular particular value of an estimator. So at times we are making estimates to make sure we have the best plausible outcome or decision based off the data. Next with a dash over it is a variable statistic that depends on the resulting sample. The sampling distribution of the sample means X is the probability distribution derived from all the means or averages that come from the possible samples of a given size. What that means is, let's say you have five different groups of customers, groups A, B, C, D, and E. And then we're looking for the average, let's say age between all five groups. And the average age is an age range between 25 and 30. That is what we're saying is that distribution of different groups, A, B, C, and D, and E, but a common overall age is that estimated or overall sample distribution of that sample mean, which means age of 25 to 30 as the average. Consider a sample mean derived from the n number of observations. Another sample mean or average can be derived from a different sample of number of observations. So in this example, group A, B, C, D, and E of the five different customer groups, while the age is the variable we're looking for on an average, there could be 100 customers in group A, 75 in group B, 60 in group C, et cetera. So that means that each sample has a different number of observations we need to take into account. Each unique customer is an observation. We repeat the process of a large number of times. The frequency of distribution of the sample means is a sampling distribution. So depending how often we look at it and how much of a random distribution it looks like. Let's take a look at this sampling distributions from an example perspective. In an example, the chefs at a local pizza chain in Cambria, California, strive to maintain the suggested size of their 16 inch pizzas. Despite their best efforts, they are unable to make every pizza exactly 100% of the time, 16 inches in diameter. The manager has determined that the size of the pizzas is normally distributed with a mean of 16 inches and a standard deviation of 0.8 inches. What this means is that on average, most of their pizzas, most of the time are 16 inches. Every now and then there's a deviation of 0.8 inches, which is probably you know less than an inch 
high or low, depending on when it's made. So some pieces could be 15.2 inches, some could be 16.8, so there's a delta there of 0.8. Question could be, what are the expected value and standard error of the sample mean, meaning 16 inches, derived from a random sample of two pizzas? And what are the expected value and standard error of the sample mean derived from a random sample of four pizzas? So what we're saying here is we can take two pizzas, meaning two number of observations, compare those two and see, is a 0.8 likely within two? Or if we expand that sample size of four pizzas, is that 0.8 standard deviation more often? Or do we have a a more closeness to 16 inches of a pizza. Here's how you calculate it. The population mean is the number of, is the actual average, which is the U symbol, which equals 16 inches. And the standard de deviation again is 0.8. So again, the restaurant owner of the pizza shop says that there's a difference of 0.8 inches at most for most pizzas he makes from the average of 16 inches. So the sample size in that first, in that first equation question of number a of two pizzas the number of two it is the e of x over that equals 16 inches so we want to find out of that two pizzas what is our standard deviation well that's a 0.8 which is that's the standard deviation divided by the overall value of the 0.2 calculation of 0.57 so what this means out of two pizzas there's a 0.57 deviation from a 16 inch pizza now we increase that to four pizzas. So the number of observations is four pizzas. We take that numerical value of 16 again, being the average pizza size of 16 inches. Then we do the same almost calculation of 0.0 of 0.8 of the two, and then we have a 0 0.40 overall deviation. So the more pizzas we look at, the more the deviation goes down. So the expected values are the same. The standard error is lower than the number of four than with number of two. So what this means is that the more observations of the more pizzas we look at, the standard error of 0.4 is less than 0.8. And if we look at two pizzas, 0.57 is closer to 0.8. So the difference in the number of pizzas does make a difference here. So this sample size needs to be larger to say that the more pizzas we analyze, the more we can see that the standard deviation from a 16 inch pizza meaning that most of the time pizzas are getting closer to that 16 inches for this example. To take it a step further in sampling distributions to make statistical inferences, it is essential that the sampling distribution of X is normally distributed. What is the underlying population that is not normally distributed? The central limit theorem CLT states that the sum or the average of a large number of independent observations from the same underlying distribution has an approximate normal distribution. The approximate steadily improves as the number of observations increases. Practitioners often use the normal distribution approximation of number observations greater than or equal to 30. What this means is that it's very important to understand at what point are the number of observations you need to look at. Often, it should be more than 30 depending on your sample size and what you're analyzing. Now, the pizza example, we went from two pizza analysis to four pizza analysis. But a larger set of data you may use more than 30 is the normal distribution you wanna look at, right? It's equal to or over 30. So for example, in market research or research in general, let's say we're analyzing a customer base, you want at least 30 customers to make a true evaluation of the statistical inference. So the more respondents you have, the more customers you analyze, or more than 30 observations, period, depending on the data you're looking at in research, the more likelihood you're going to get a better preciseness of the statistical inference to conclude a hypothesis or estimation. So from an estimation perspective, we're always looking for that 95% or higher value and confidence level in statistics to say, yes, this is likely to occur or not, especially in predictive analytics. Hypothesis testing is making an assumption and truly like any kind of research you're doing, you're going into it with a hypothesis, a potential outcome that you're looking to uh, validate. Each and every day, people make decisions based on their beliefs about the true state of the world. And in business, we're always looking for things based off trends and experience to truly build a view and even validate our assumptions and opinions. We hold certain things to be true and others to be false and then act accordingly. The formation of these beliefs may have started as a mere conjecture and informed guess, 
or a proposition tentatively advanced as true. So again, we need fact and data to support our assumptions. This is where hypothesis testing and business analytics can help us do that. When people formulate a belief in this way, refer to it as a hypothesis. Sooner or later, every hypothesis eventually confronts evidence that either substantiates or refutes it. Determining the validity of an assumption is the nature of hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing is used to resolve conflicts between two competing hypotheses on a particular, on a particular population of interest. Sometimes in business, it's actually an internal debate about what to do about a strategy. So we're gonna to go to hypothesis testing to find another way to find out which conclusion makes the most sense and which strategy to go with in business decisions. So the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis is denoted as H0. What this means is it's the first hypothesis. It's the null means what you're going into as the direct hypothesis. We believe our customers are doing this and that's the null. The alternative hypothesis is denoted as HA. So there's always a, a secondary element to a secondary theory on a second view. So you're either looking at one or the other. We conduct a hypothesis test to determine whether or not a sample evidence contradicts H0. So the null hypothesis is what we're trying to dispute. We go into that's our main objective. That's what we're looking to find out. Is it true or not? We can make one or two decisions. We either reject the null hypothesis or do not reject the null hypothesis. To reject the null hypothesis, that means we have a significance level below 0.95 and or 95% and other data variables to say it's not correct, right? Whereas we say do not reject the null hypothesis, meaning that the null hypothesis, the straightforward view or assumption we came in with was actually accurate or more accurate than we initially thought, meaning do not reject it. It is accurate enough to make a statistical inference that we should go forward with that assumption. Further with the hypothesis testing, if a sample evidence is inconsistent with a null hypothesis, we must reject the null hypothesis. Conversely, if the sample evidence is not inconsistent with the null hypothesis, hypothesis, we do not reject it. What this means is in the sample data we're using, right? We talked earlier about how to look at sample kind of, you know, groups of data within an overall population. Well, if that helps support the null hypothesis, it's not inconsistent, it is significant in value then we do not reject it. Whereas the opposite, opposite would be, we do reject it. It is not correct to conclude that we accept the null hypothesis because while the sample information may not be inconsistent with the null hypothesis, it doesn't always necessarily prove that the null hypothesis is true. We just accept it and we will look further to find insight to make sure our hypothesis of the null is correct. Very crucial is the information of the two competing hypotheses because the conclusion of the test depends on now how, the, how the hypothesis is stated. The null hypothesis is the status quo. It, the null again is what we assume to be true. Unable to reject the null hypothesis maintains the status quo or business as usual. So we either say it's equal to or greater than or equal to or less than or equal to. The alternate hypothesis is whatever we wish to establish. Rejecting the null hypothesis establishes that the evidence supports the alternative and may require some sort of action. This contains the opposite sign as found in the null hypothesis. So, for example, if we want to say it's exact 100%, we must use the word equal. But often in a null hypothesis, we want a range either less than or equal to or greater than or equal to. So if it's above the equal to and greater than or below the equal to and less than, we can still support the null hypothesis. But remember, a less than or equal to or greater than or equal to evaluation means just that, that there's still something there to say, why is it less than or why is it greater than or equal to? You can do something called a one tail test, which it simply means, is it on the greater than end of the spectrum or less than the alternative? A two tail test is where you'll actually include equals is not equal to. So you wanna find out things on both sides. Is it truly gonna equal it or not? Is that evaluation? And generally follow three simple steps when formulating a complete hypothesis or when formulating a competing hypothesis. One, identify the relevant population parameter of interest. Two, determine whether it is a one or two-tailed test. Do we wanna look at both sides of 
greater than or less than for a one tail test, or do we truly care about what's greater than or less than and nothing in between? Include some, so, some form of equality sign in the null hypothesis and use the alternative hypothesis to establish a claim. So again, do you want it to be precise and equal to something, or do you want it to be on the greater than or less than side of things to be not within the middle of the diagram? So in summary, for hypothesis testing, there are two approaches when truly looking to see if your findings are conclusive or not, and your hypothesis has a significant value that yes, it's directionally acceptable. The two approaches are implementing a critical value approach or a p-value approach. Now, the critical value approach is attractive when you don't have a statistical kind of software and analytical suite to do it for you, and if you do the calculation by hand. But most companies, most organizations, researchers, and business analysts prefer the p-value approach because just about every statistical software out there reports on a p-value. Again, we wanna focus on a p-value because it provides that if it's a p-value of 0.05 or less, that means you have a high significant value. If you do the opposite of that and subtract 100 or 1.05, that means 0.95. So anything at 0.95, 0.96, 0.97, and above just means you have a 95% or higher likelihood that this statistical model is providing a value that yes says there's confidence here that this is accurate. This probable outcome or hypothesis you've conducted is more than likely going to occur. Then from there, you make your business decisions, they run with that, provide data value insights, and you're on your way. Overall, thank you for your time in this overview of this chapter, and we'll see you soon.